everybody. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ryan and uh, Joe for allowing me to preach today. I understand that uh, they really only ask a person to preach for them twice. Once when they're rising in popularity and, and really being enjoyed by the congregation, and the other when they're on their way down ready to crash and burn. So Thank you very much for allowing me to be here again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We're glad to have you. That's right. I don't really know anything about that much, but I do know this, that today I have a word from God for you. Yeah. And uh, in keeping in our regular tradition, we are uh, going through the, the book of Genesis, as uh, most of you know, and... Uh, I'm going to preach from Genesis chapter 21, and also in keeping with our uh, uh, tradition, we have some questions that will go up on the screen there for each table to discuss. The first one is just kind of a f just for fun question, because uh, it uh, asks the question, do you know what your name means? Uh, and and uh, like, for example, my name. And, and my name means either uh, who is like God or one who is like God. And uh, the second question of that part, part one, is uh, does, that, does your name reflect your character? So if my name means one who is like God, you can be certain that it doesn't really reflect my character. Uh, but it does... Uh, the question, who is like God, really kind of reflects my character because in the, the um, what, 30 years or so now that I've been a Christian, that is the number one question in my life. Who is God and what is he like? So we're going to spend a little bit of time on that, but don't take too much time on that one. The real uh, heart of the, the message today is in the second two questions, uh, what promises are you waiting on for the Lord today? And how long are you willing to wait for those promises? So what you do is you, we're going to take about 7 minutes and 23 seconds. I've got it marked on my, on my uh, clock here. <laughs> 7 minutes and 23 seconds to discuss that at each table. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 7 goes like this. The Lord visited Sarah as he said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. I think this is a spectacular passage of Scripture. And uh, there are really at least two um, truths that we can learn from this passage of Scripture. Do you want to know what they are? Yes. Say, let's hear it, Brother Mike. Let's hear it, Brother Mike. Okay, okay. Since you asked, I'll tell you. Two very important lessons that we can learn. The first is... Names are significant because they describe either character or events. And the second is, God's promises happen in his good time, not ours. And we can respond 
out of uh, obedience and gratitude. Now, for the first one, names are significant in the Bible. We know this because God changes people's names. He changed Abram, exalted father, to Abraham, father of a multitude. And like I said before, my name is Michael. Who is like God? The name of one of the top three archangels. Uh, the other two, you know the other two archangels? Gabriel, Gabriel and? Like yeah, Lucifer. Okay, so you have both Michael and Gabriel have the two letters E-L in it, which refer to God. That's the word God in Hebrew. Gabriel, the warrior of God or the, uh, the strong man of God. And uh, Michael, who is like God? The only one of the three arch archangels whose name doesn't have the E-L in it is Lucifer. And there's all kinds of uh, speculation. I love to speculate. There's all kinds of speculation as to why that is, uh, that his name is Lucifer and doesn't have the name of the word God in it. And I think, uh, well, there's two top reasons. One is um, that God changed his name. Once he fell, God changed his name uh, to Lucifer, the uh, shining one. Uh, and um, well, that could possibly be it, but I kind of lean towards uh, Milton's Paradise Lost. Uh, Milton suggests that the name of uh, Lucifer, that God named him Lucifer intentionally to, because uh, the word, the shining one, could refer directly to God. But it also could refer to Lucifer himself, who was the brightest and, sh and the, the wisest and the most beautiful of all of the angels. And that, in the, the, the thinking of Milton, kind of pushes uh, Lucifer into rebelling against God. Now, that's a, kind of hard to swallow, but... But uh, it, there's, some, there's something about it that makes it seem true to me. And last week, I think it was last week, Joe mentioned uh, Moab and Ben-Ami. Uh, Moab and Ben-Ami are the sons of Lot. Uh, Lot was there and left town just as the Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by fire. And then they end up. Uh, his wife is destroyed as she turns back, to, turns into a pillar of salt, and they end up in a cave in the mountains. So you have Lot and his two daughters in a cave in the mountains, and then for some unbelievable reason, they think this is a good idea. Oh, we're the last people on earth, so in order to propagate the species and, you know, fill the earth, we should get our father drunk and have sex with him and have children by our father. That's not a good thing. You know, I, you know, I can't understand what would make them think that. That would be the right thing to do. But Moab means uh, the, uh, uh, of my father, from my father. And ben Amis means son of my people. So both of those names are given to... Uh, these two sons, uh, as, an, as a name of shame, to identify what happened to create them, to bring them about. And they were so despised among the people of Israel that uh, Moabites were not allowed to come into the tabernacle for ten generations. You had to, if a Moabite became a Jew, they had to wait 10 generations before their children could go into the, to the tabernacle or the temple. But even there, it shows the grace of God. Because Ruth, you remember the story of Ruth? Ruth is a Moabite woman. And then she has a son, Obed, who has a son, Jesse, who has a son who's David the king. And David's son builds the temple and sanctifies it. So God is, uh, is gracious even to something this horrible. In fact, uh, Ruth is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. 
So when God is gracious, he's really gracious. Uh, I once met a scholar who denied uh, the accuracy of the Gospels because he said there are so many Marys in the Gospels. Now think about it. You got Mary Magdalene. You have Mary, the mother of Jesus. You have uh, Mary, the, the sister of Martha. And then you have one that's simply called the other Mary. <laughs> Yeah, you're the other Mary. And he says that, can't, that, 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 that those are just made-up names. That's just a name that they put in there because they couldn't think of anything else, I suppose. And I told him, well, no, no, it makes perfect sense. Think about it. Uh, those people, the Israelites, were under the oppression of the Roman Empire. And if you did have a child, you would want to have a son. But if you had a daughter in the most bitter oppression that they'd ever seen, it would be natural to name her Mary. Because Mary means bitterness. bitterness. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Names are significant in the scriptures. They describe character. They describe events. So Abraham and, and Sarah, though, they didn't have to uh, give a name uh, to their son. God chose the name. He chose the name Isaac, which means laughter. laughter. Very good. And you know, I think this is just one of those times when you can see that God has a sense of humor. I mean, throughout the scriptures, you find God have a, has a sense of humor. Uh, and uh, I think that's one of the things that demonstrates that we were created in the image of God. Because we can laugh. No other creature has the ability to laugh. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What about the laughing hyena? No, you tell the laughing hyena joke, he will not get it. <laughs> he will not get it. So uh, uh, laughter sets us apart as having part of the image of God. And if you look carefully throughout the scriptures, you know, like Jesus says, huh, did you hear about, did you hear the one about the guy that had a, a speck in his eye, you know, and, and, or a log in his eye, he tells the other guy to take the speck out first? No, there's a, there's a lot of humor in the scriptures that we kind of overlook. There's one in, uh, by Paul. Paul's talking to Titus and uh, tells Titus, whatever you do, don't believe a word the Cretans tell you because they're all liars. A Cretan himself told me so. <laughs> so laughter sets us apart. And so Sarah, if you, you remember the reason why uh, the child's name was, la was laughter, Isaac, is because Sarah laughed when she heard that uh, uh, she was going to bear a son in her old age. Now, if we were going to give Sarah the benefit of the doubt, we would probably say, okay, she's laughing out of pure joy that God was going to finally uh, answer her uh, prayers and all of that. But in reality, that's not the case. From the, from the context, you can see that she was laughing simply because she didn't believe it was possible. Proverbs 14, 13 says, Laughter can, see, can conceal a heavy heart. But when laughter ends, the grief remains. Now, I believe that uh, uh, Sarah, of all the women in the Old Testament, Sarah was the most long-suffering. Consider all that her husband had put her through. And we talked about this several times in, uh, in the study of the book of Genesis consider all those things that her husband put her through. He said, come on, Sarah, we're going to the promised land. Oh, where's that? I don't know. And then they go off, and, and uh, everywhere they go, Abraham says, okay, tell people that you're my sister, which is kind of true, so that they'll take you, but won't kill me to take you. Now, that's not... Uh, that, that would cause a lot of grief in any woman's heart. But worst of all is not being able to have a child. 
In those days, having a son was the number one priority of all women, the crowning jewel of a woman's life. So the fact that she was unable to give her husband a son caused her shame and grief and disappointment. And you can see that in, in how desperate she was in giving over her handmaid to her husband to have a son, uh, hoping that he would uh, have the son by Hagar. It must have grieved her day and night, every day of her life. Nevertheless, God finally answers her prayer and gives her a son and names him laughter. I heard that, uh, you know, Proverbs 17, 22 says, a cheerful heart is good medicine. And of course, you probably know, you know, they say laughter is, is uh, good medicine. Norman Cousins wrote a book once called Anatomy of an Illness. In this book, he describes how he had uh, contracted a uh, painful, debilitating disease. And he described that in the hospital, he discovered that watching 15 minutes of uh, Three Stooges on television could give him about two hours of relief from pain. Now, I'm not really, you know, all that confident in the idea of this laughter therapy I don't think it's a cure for everything. Uh, I don't think, uh, but the reason I don't think it's a cure for everything is simply that I don't think everyone has a good sense of humor. <laughs> and I've developed a test. Two questions to see if you have a sense of humor or not. You want to hear it? Yeah. Say, let's hear it, Brother Mike. Let's hear it, Brother Mike. Okay. Since you asked, I'll tell you. Two questions. The first question is, where do you get dragon's milk? Where do you get dragon milk? No, from a cow with very short legs. <laughs> yeah, see, that's a test. The, the second question is, okay, since you didn't like that one, the second question is, <laughs> what do you call a cow that can't give milk? A no, a milk dud. <laughs> okay, see, that describes whether or not you have a sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> names. See, I, so that's why I don't think I'm not too confident in that laughter therapy. I don't think everybody has a good sense of humor. Uh, names are very significant in the scripture. They describe character. They describe some event. And the second point I wanted to make is that God's promises happen in His good time, not ours, and we can respond in obedience and gratitude. Or as my granddaughter told me the other day, she, she whispered in my ear, uh, I was talking about this with, with my daughter, and uh, my granddaughter whispered in my ear, God takes his own sweet time about things. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you're nine years old. I'm 64. You have no idea. <laughs> But God does take his own sweet time about things. Look at the scriptures again. It says, The Lord visited Sarah as he had said. He had made this promise to them. And the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. In other words, God did this in his own time. He gave them a child in his own time, and the, in their old age. Consider God's promises in the Bible. He promises land to Abraham. But the only land Abraham ever owned was the plot of ground he was buried in. And he had to pay for that. And then that promise passed on to Isaac. 
And then it passed on to Jacob, three generations. And Jacob died in a foreign country. And all of his family were slaves for 400 years. God takes his own sweet time about things. And consider the promise in Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That sounds really good, doesn't it? I like that. But remember, this is written to the people of Israel just before they go into captivity for 70 years under the Babylonian captivity. So they went 70 years in Babylonian captivity, and just about the time they get back home, rebuild the temple, rebuild the wall around the temple, they're conquered by the Greeks. And the Greeks do horrible things to them, including the uh, abomination of desolation by Antiochus Epiphanes, who desecrates a temple in Jerusalem. And then after 40 years of warfare, fighting the Maccabean Wars, they finally get freedom from the Greeks. And then the Romans come in and conquer them. Then the Romans oppress them worse than anybody has oppressed them before. And the and Romans even crucify their Messiah. And scatter them around the world. In 70 AD, they get uh, scattered. They lose their war against the Romans. Then, of course, you have the Inquisition in the Middle Ages. Then you have, in Nazi Germany, you have uh, six million Jews are destroyed. Then you have all the... Uh, uh, the uh, destruction by, of the Jews in Russia, in the Soviet Russia. That does not sound like a good plan. That does not sound like a plan to prosper them or, and not to harm them and to give them hope. That sounds like a, a plan for misery. But remember, God takes his own sweet time about things. Consider this. Isaac married Rebekah. And remember, God chose Rebekah specifically for him. Because I guess because God wanted uh, Rebekah's DNA in Jacob and Esau, and therefore in Joseph, and therefore in David and Solomon and the Savior Jesus Christ. God wanted Rebekah's DNA mixed in. But if Isaac was born to Abraham and Sarah when they were young, remember who, who Rebekah is. She is the granddaughter of Nahor, who's Abraham's brother. So if Isaac had, had uh, been born early on, Rebekah would have been a baby when he's looking for a wife. See, God takes his own sweet time for a reason. He's got a reason to take his time because he wants everything to be at the right time, at the perfect time. He wants everything to be in his good time. So the bottom line is that uh, uh, God has good reason to take his own sweet time about keeping his promises. And sometimes one of the reasons is to give you maximum joy in the fulfillment of those promises. Now think about Sarah. She'd have been happy to have a, a child when she was young and, you know, uh, vibrant and all of that. But now she's 100 years old and... Uh, and uh, she has a son, and she says, God has made laughter for me. Everyone here who hears this will laugh over me. Who would have thought that Abraham and Sarah would nurse children? Yet I've borne him a son in his old age. She died at the age of 127, and I believe when she died, she was 
she was completely content and fulfilled and vindicated because she had a son in her old age. See, God takes his own sweet time about things. It took over 2,000 years for the promised Messiah to come. God kept promising them, oh, I've got a Messiah coming for you. I got a Messiah coming for you. Next generation, oh, yeah, there's a Messiah coming. Next generation, oh, yeah, there's, the king of, is coming. Yeah, the, the son of David, yeah, all of those things he promised over and over and over again. 2,000 years at least. And then Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. It was the perfect time for the Messiah to be born. The Romans had brought a relative peace, even though there was oppression. They had built roads all across the known world. They had a common language, common monetary system. The world was ripe to hear the, the good news of Jesus Christ. So think about it. You got 120 people in the upper room the day of Pentecost. And within 300 years, under, under Theod Theodosius II, suddenly, well, not suddenly, it took 300 years, you have, you have uh, Christianity becoming the official religion of the Roman Empire. Goes from a hundred, an obscure little religion in an obscure little place in in Israel, to being the dominant religion of the entire Roman Empire. Because God took his own sweet time about bringing the Messiah. So we're also called upon to wait. This is the worst part. I just, I really hate to wait. You know, you go to a restaurant and you're sitting around waiting, and they call the person that serves you, the waiter, but you're the one that's doing the waiting. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I really don't like to wait, but God calls upon us to wait for his time, for his timing. We're called upon to think forward, to look to the future, to realize that he will fulfill his promises. Now, I'll tell you how forward-thinking I am. Fifteen years ago, I bought a little tiny redwood tree up in Northern California. You know, the one that's in a little tiny little pot. And I planted it in my front yard. Now, my house on Prospect Avenue is right under the, the flight path for Gillespie Field. And I figure that in 250 years, that tree will be so tall that those planes will have to go around it. <laughs> now, I may not be here to see that, but I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm thinking forward. <laughs> so, you know, we are called upon by God to look forward to the coming Messiah, uh, to the, the coming of Jesus Christ. He's coming back. I think most of you use that in, as part of that uh, in our circle talk uh, that Jesus, that he promised he was going to return. Uh, Psalm 27 verse 14 says, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. He had said that twice in one verse. And so that verse was written specifically for me. So I just really don't like waiting. Uh, but there's one thing that you should never wait for. And that is the wait for, he says, now is the day of salvation. You don't have to wait for that. The promise is for you right now. Now is the day of salvation. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you don't have to wait another moment. You can uh, make Jesus Christ your Savior right now by calling upon the name of the Lord. So we're going to bow for a word of prayer. And I'm going to say a, a, a prayer of a, a salvation kind of prayer. And if you have never accepted Christ as your Savior, this is your opportunity. You can... Pray to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. 
So everybody bow your head, close your eyes. And I'm going to pray. If you can make this your prayer for the first time, make it your prayer and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Almighty God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that Jesus came, died on the cross, rose from the dead to forgive my sins. I now ask you to forgive me, cleanse me, fill me with your spirit, make me one of your children. I yield myself to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let the-